Howdy folks. You know, back in 2020, when we realized that we were not going to have a typical Lake Superior Big Top Chautauqua season, we started recording little snippets of performances of music, interviews, storytelling, uh, going back into the archives and digging out some video of uh, performances from years gone by. We put them all together in what we called Tiny Tent Shows. We did over 40 Tiny Tent Shows. And what you're about to see now is a rebroadcast, an encore airing, if you will, of a previously recorded Tiny Tent Show. Thank you so much for supporting us, and we look forward to seeing you back beneath the canvas. <laughs> Howdy folks and welcome to Tiny Tent Show number 9 where once again we'll check in with some of the folks you may have only seen previously on stage at the Lake Superior Big Top Chautauqua. We'll check in, see how they're doing, we'll uh, hear some music, some poetry, uh, some silly bits and uh, later Ed Willett is going to show up and, and interview someone fascinating. Uh, I don't want to reveal who the guest is, I'm only going to tell you that he's got a really nice round head. When we first started doing these things, it was cold out and miserable, and I was wearing my cap that I usually wear because for some reason my head gets cold easily. And uh, today it's nice and warm, so I thought, well, what the heck, I'll just reveal the roundness of my doll. It is never too early for a BCO flashback. BCO standing for Blue Canvas Orchestra. And that's how we're gonna start the show tonight. Uh, it's a Warren Nelson song called Come Our Sailing Day. And in 1998, as part of the Wisconsin sesquicentennial show, 30th Star, which was written by Warren Nelson, the BCO took the big tent to the people and they performed 30th Star in 13 different cities for audiences that included thousands of school kids. And here's an excerpt from one of those performances now. It was a wind of immigrants blowing east to west, over the sea, away to America, away from all the dead ends of the long divided lands of Europe, over America, away to Wisconsin, to the free homestead lands, to the cheap cutover pine and railroad lands. The high tides of immigration came here in the 1880s and 90s. The landless came to this land. Goodbye to Sweden and Norway. I renounce Goodbye. forever all allegiance and fidelity to Oscar King to Sweden and Norway. Goodbye to Russia. I renounce forever all allegiance and victory. Goodbye. Forever. A letter came with a steamship ticket. A bitter cup of coffee drunk in parting. The immigrant left and the home folks wept. Come on, say Another begins. Will I ever see my father and my mother again? We're off, off to New, New Wisconsin. Wisconsin. Last night we slept on the king's old side. Today our fate's in the palm of God. Nine weeks in this stinking ship. We're stacked like cattle in the hold, hold on. We come off Ellis Island with a brand new name. Thank God we're through and we're on this train to Buffalo where we get the boat. For the distant shores of Superior, come our sailing day, come our sailing day. I won't forget that first sweet hour, we set foot on a homestead claim. It was spring and the woods were white with flowers, between the stumps this land was ours. There's no worse off than our neighbors up the road, there was so little money in the land in bay. Men found work in the camps and the mills on the docks and the quarries in these iron Pinocchio hills. 
That summer we put up the house and the barn We're slaves all day to the axe and the hoe One for the beetle And one for the crow One for the cutworm One to grow At first we stuck to the mother tongue The Christian would step and the song we kept A memory close of the old country But here we stood All new Americans Some of the old ways disappeared In that first hard long winter here We shared our time and the strength in our hands Help was a word that followed us around Come on, say of the old country. We came over in a colony, all together, all to be free. We come over in a settlement to the betterment of our children. The heydays faded. Some left. Some stayed. Out of the people, a state was made in the shame of the schemes and the dreams we raised. This land's in your hands now. Come on, say. I can't say that I was around for any of those 1998 shows, but one of my favorite things to do at the Lake Superior Big Top Chautauqua is to stand just off stage in the wings and watch as the Blue Canvas Orchestra just uncorks a fast one. And certainly this next song would qualify. It's Sailor's Hornpipe, and you'll hear the music played over images assembled by Betty Ferris, and the images reflect northern Wisconsin's nautical nature. <laughs> This next song is presented by BCO regulars, and the song is called Two in a Canoe. It was written by Warren Nelson for the big top show Wild River, and that show celebrated the designation of the St. Croix River as a protected wild and scenic river. Randy and Jane. How can I feel so free and easy? How come you look so much like you back there all day? You never lose it to be carried along like a child on this wild river My soul has gone to my shoulder. I'm pulling on the upper St. Croix. I'm back in the water, saddle paddle, two in a canoe. Well, the water's low this year. We better put in at Riverside. Round the first bend, already it's another world. And on which side of this island, looking for a channel to go with the flow. Even in this drought, 
listen to the St. Croix sing. We'll camp at Little Yellow Banks tonight. Have a fire and a nip, sing some cowboy songs. Well, you can pay a psychiatrist a hundred bucks an hour just to spit your troubles too. Or you can take a week off work, rent a canoe, and shut up. How can I feel so free and easy? How come you look so much like you back there? All day you never lose it to be carried along like a child on this wild river way. My soul is gone to my shoulder. I'm pulling on the upper St. Croix. I'm back in the water, side of paddle, doing a canoe. Now what's there in that cooler for our breakfast on the river? If we had some eggs, we could have some ham and eggs if we had some ham. Well, let's start with the jolt of camp coffee, should I? Or do you want to do it? Pour too many scoops in a boiling pot. Stir it, smell it, chew it. Ah, oh, then we'll slide out, glide, ride the river down. We'll tip our hat to all the tributaries coming in. And then a week from now in bed, the sound of these rapids will be still. Running through my head, rushing my dreams along. Saving this winding waterway. It's an answer to a prayer said way back there 30 years ago. Well, it's our day now in the July sun, but for all the children let you come, it's a gift, a blessing, a memory, a main thing. I can't get to sleep. I'm starlit moon eyed wild. Tell those otters I want to come to their party. I want to move through the water, seems the best that I can do is to wake up in the morning mist with you two in a canoe. How can I feel so free and easy? How come you look so much like you back there all day? You never lose it to be carried along like a child on this wild river way. My soul is gone to my shoulder. I'm pulling on the upper St. Croix. I'm back in the water, saddle paddle, two in a canoe. Oh, my soul is gone to my shoulder. I'm pulling on the upper St. Croix. I'm back in the water, saddle paddle, two in a canoe. Two in a canoe, in honor of the St. Croix River. May she ever run wild. So last week, we were witness to an exchange between Oli and Shren, and based on their behavior, I wondered aloud if anybody had checked in on Lena. Well, good news, folks. You know, just between us, I am having the time of my life. This COVID-19 is a little bit of a blessing in disguise for me, don't you know? I sent Oli to the garage about a month ago, and lo and behold, I clean the house. It stays clean. Nobody's asking me where things are. And the best part, I haven't had to clean a fish in over a month. Now, of course, you don't have to share that with Oli, right? You know, 
I'm sure he's pretty down and fairly miserable without me. For the first time in over 40 years, I'm a happily married man. But I had a great aunt once in the 1960s, and she got pneumonia. Now, of course, she recovered from it, but I'm pretty sure that leaves me with a predisposed condition. Or at least that's what I'm telling Oli. I started watching some YouTube videos. Oh my goodness. They've got everything under the sun in that their channel. You can learn how to do anything. They call them DIY videos, yeah. That was the initial of my first boyfriend, Dagmar Ivan Janssen. Mm -hmm. It stands for do-it-yourself, which is funny because that's what Oli says to me every time I ask him to do a chore. You know, nowadays it's so important to wear masks when you go outside. It protects you and it protects your neighbors too. And that doesn't mean that you can't be stylish while you're wearing one. Looky here. It's a stormy Cromer mask, straight from the factory. Aren't they lovely? They come in two colors, blue plaid and red plaid. I got the blue one so it would match my eyes. And I got Oli, the red one, for the same reason. You know what else is important? Self-care. That's right, we need to take care of ourselves and make sure that we're happy and healthy in this difficult time. So you know what I did. I pulled out my grandma's good glasses. You know, the ones in back that we never use. And I poured in some wine and I felt so fancy. I decided to put on my good fancy glasses and have a little drink. So I do that every day and it makes such a difference. So cheers to you and to you, Lena. Cheers. Well. I, I guess things could be going worse. Honestly, they both seem to be thriving. Or as we say around here, thriving. Tom Mitchell and Ed Willett may be safer at home, but that doesn't stop them from making some music together this week. And here they are now, syncing up on their rendition of All Along the Watchtower. <laughs> be some way out of here said the joker to the thief there is a too much confusion I can't get no relief businessmen they drink my wine plowman dig my earth but none of them along my line knows what any of it is worth
Tom Mitchell and Ed Willett snuck little Beatles in there, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so from Tom and Ed, we now go to the shores of a very large lake where the storyteller and musician Laughing Fox is ready to share with us. Aho, Buju Anishinaabe Duk. Hello to my relatives. Bape Wagush Nindijinikaj. Laughing Fox is my name. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, um, my uh, English name is Michael Charette, and I'm a Native American uh, flute player, storyteller. Um, I'm a member of the Red Cliff Band, the Lake Superior Chippewa. And I'm a part of uh, Big Top Chautauqua's uh, Community Connection series. And, um, you know, they connect community and culture, you know, all throughout the world. So, Chimmy Glitch. Um, the song I'm going to play for you today, um, I learned out in the woods. And here we are by Gichigumi on the shores of Gichigumi, where I first learned this song. The song has an title, the shale in the background. Laughing Fox, playing music born in the forest right next to the shores of Lake Kichigumi. Well, most weeks I interview somebody at some point during the show, and this week I was not allowed to. Ed Willett handled the interview. Um, all I got to say is good luck with this one, Ed. All right. Well, hey, everybody. We're going to... We're going to turn the tables on Michael Perry here just for a little bit and, and see how he likes it being interviewed. So I'm your, uh, your host here just for, just for giggles because, you know, you'll see Michael's much better at it. But uh, 
Hey, Michael, welcome to the show, your show, our show. Well, glad, glad to be here. I am, I just realized something, which is I, I put my laptop on my knees because I thought, well, that's perfect framing. And now I realize yes. if I move at all, I wiggle the entire screen. So I'll sit here very consciously trying not to move. <laughs> also, all right. The good news is I'm pretty comfy because I'm in my, my old green chair. I've written about it off and on in my books and columns. And this chair belonged to my grandma. I think she probably bought it in the 40s or 50s. And it really probably should have been burned a long time ago. It's No, it's no, no. Potentially even revolting. But man, I, I've read so many books in this chair. And then also, can't lie to you, I've taken a lot of naps in this chair. <laughs> Possibly even one earlier today. All right. Well, it's a fine line between naps and writing a book, I hear. That's right. <laughs> well, hey, I I don't know any other professional writers. You're you're my only one. So I'm I got a couple of questions that I I wanted to ask. Um when was the do you remember the first time you wrote something and you read over it later and you thought, you know, I may have something here. This might be uh, a vocation this might be something i could do and and convince other people do you remember that at all well i'm smiling because oddly enough i mean i wrote like all kids wrote things off and on as a child and i had some teachers who gave me great opportunities to write and i found out that i enjoyed writing but it was never a focus i, I was an, a voracious reader from the age of four, I read everything I could get my hands on, but it never occurred to me that people like me or from places like where I grew up or people who were farmers and loggers would even be allowed to write books. So I was all the way out <laughs> of college before I took uh, the idea of writing with intent, with any intent beyond a grade as something yeah. that was even available to someone like me. But I was smiling just because I do remember the first time that I wrote something for publication and thought, yeah, that's, that's pretty good. And I think I could do this. And the reason I'm smiling is because then I go back and read it 10 years later and go, no, that was really awful. And you should have <laughs> done more years before plan out as the musicians say, but that's also part of the process. There's, even if you're a humble person and I try to be, but if you're telling the truth and any musician that takes the stage, there's, there is always ego in play, no matter how gentle and thoughtful you are. Otherwise, you wouldn't pick up the instrument and get on stage, or you wouldn't sit down to write the essay and go, I think people probably want to hear this. And I think maybe where you get in trouble is if you start thinking people need to hear me. Um, ah. anyway, that's, that's kind of a sideways answer to your question, but it's, for me, it's no. the one. It's that I thought I was ready long before I was ready. <laughs> 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 that's good. That's good. Hey, um, you were saying you're a voracious, you were a voracious reader all along. Where did that come from? Were books around your home or your parents read or yeah, where that did you pick question, that up? That question I can answer very specifically. Uh, it was my mom. So the very short version of the story is I was raised in a, a church with a set of beliefs that uh, we were not allowed to go to movies. We were not allowed to have a television in the house. We didn't even have a radio. Um, and so you can see the potential downsides of some of that. But my parents also, um, my mom particularly, loved books. And she took us to the Little Tech Library. I remember it as every week. Maybe it was every month. But I remember that going there all the time and just coming home with piles of books. And she saw from an early age that I loved books. And she taught me to read. She sent away for a phonics book um, when I was four years old. She ordered a phonics book from a Chicago newspaper. And she taught me to read yeah. a little comic book about sounds. And so from the age of four, I just was reading all the time. And I've even joked. And I, I mean, I read some literature. And of course, being a church kid, I was reading the Bible a lot. But I also really, it was mostly cowboy books. And of those, <laughs> one of them were Louis L'Amour. And the joke always is my dad had pretty mixed emotions about my reading because he's he'd be always trying to find me to clean a calf pen or rake hay or something. And I'd be out on the porch with my nose in a book. And he said one time that he lost more man hours to Louis, Le Louis L'Amour than to uh, I think the football pickup trucks and girls combined. 
<laughs> but yes, it was That's good. It was my mom that sat beside me and read to me. And then when I showed an interest in sounding out words on my own, took the time to teach me to read before I was even in school. And so that is absolutely where the love of, of, of books came from. I also was raised by pretty blue collar working class people, but I had grandfathers who traveled and read a lot. And um, there was just this idea that if you couldn't get on a train or a plane and go somewhere, you did have a book. And you could really travel all over the world, even if you were hiding on the farm porch in Chippewa Right, right. Yeah, that's 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 ex that's excellent. I I um when you mentioned uh, losing more to Louis L'Amour than to sports and girls, I wondered, did you? I asked this of a lot of uh, artists. Did you play sports when you were a kid? Did you? Did I you do the formal? Thing. Yeah, I mean, in grade school, it was more just running around the farm and working on the farm and being knuckleheads and right. playing. But Different kind of sport. Yeah. And now that you bring it up, I forgot about this, but I took piano lessons until seventh grade. And then I traded piano lessons for football. And I can't lie, I loved football. I loved playing football. I played from seventh grade all the way through my senior year. Um, I did, I ran track as well. Uh, my parents, we had a farm and we were expected to help, but we were treated fairly about it. Dad never treated us like free labor, like often happened in some families. We were expected to work and work hard and do certain things for the family, but there were also opportunities for us to work and get paid a little bit, very little. He, he gave us marks and it wasn't until we were older we figured out that one mark equaled one penny. <laughs> He might have checked oh, into that earlier. Yeah, but, he, was, you know. he was very kind, but he didn't, but he didn't overpay us either. <laughs> so <laughs> right. didn't have allowance. Uh, my parents said, no, you need to earn what you get. So anyway, I'm off track already. Um, but he did say you could play two sports, but that was it. You had to choose. So I chose football and basketball. I loved football. I'll talk about that in a second. I also, I went off for basketball because that's where all the cool guys played when they weren't playing football. Uh, unfortunately, I was a terrible basketball player, awful, and I had no ability to shoot, dribble, anything, and I'm not very quick, and, and so luckily, I got in trouble with one of my teachers, and I got uh, a punishment at school, and my parents said, well, you're off the basketball team, um, and, it happened, <laughs> and so it, it happened so early, though, that they said, if you can not get in trouble for the rest of the year, you can go out for a spring sport. So I went out for track and turned out I really liked track and I was really good at the mile and two mile. And so for the rest of my school career, I did football and track. Um, so uh, that's, the, greatest, that's so, yeah. the greatest thing that ever happened to me was getting kicked off the basketball team because I, I was wasting everybody <laughs> on the basketball team. The <laughs> you know, the reason I, I, ask, I ask about that is because um, there's so much discipline that goes into being um, a self-employed artist yeah. that I think is kind of interesting. I found it to be interesting to people to know, um, you know, you get up in the morning, you have your schedule, but your schedule is, is strict, but it's strict because you decide it, it's strict. And the reason I asked about sports is because I feel like some of that discipline um, that you learn in, in sports can be applied to the arts really well. I, that's been my experience, you know, I, and so that's, that's why I asked you. And, and that kind of leads me into a question I had about, like right now, what's, what's a day in the life, just schedule wise, what, how does it go for you? I would say the freelance life um, right now is, I always think in terms of my EMS and nursing background, ambulance work, and that is triage. You yeah. literally get up in the morning and go, what happened yeah, yeah. at the end of the day? What do we, if I don't turn this in, I'm not going to get paid. If I don't get this done, I don't get the next gig. And so a lot of it is not so much planned ahead as it is planned for you just by deadlines. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, there is, yeah. I love what you said with the sports reference because I hadn't thought about that much. I'm very quick always to say, well, I learned how to survive as an artist by watching my dad be a farmer and a logger. It's like nobody applauded and nobody made him go to the woods or go milk the cows twice a day. But if he didn't do it, he lost the farm. 
And that's sort of yeah. how I am with writing and art. It's like, if I don't get out there and make the work, because I'm not famous, I just, I have an audience, but I have to keep working, um, then no one else will do it. But you mentioned sports, and I, I tend to not denigrate sports, because I love them, but I, I do think they get overemphasized. Like, every time I hear someone go, well, sports teach you about oh. what? I was go, yeah, they teach you that if you have a very special talent, all the other rules don't apply to you. But yeah, I was such a bad basketball player that I, I never had to worry about that. But what I will say is that, um, so football, the thing I've always loved about football is even if you're down by 25 points in the fourth quarter, there's still a chance if you work really, really hard. <laughs> and then in, in track, especially I did distance, it's kind of lonely. Someone can't do it for you and you just got to spend the time. And if you don't spend the time, you find out on race day. And so between those two ethos, if I'm using the term right, um, that you're right. Yeah. Yeah, I think that whole concept of uh, it's going to be uncomfortable for a period of time, maybe for years, but eventually it'll be worth it, yeah. is uh, something that you can get out of that, any kind of experience that, that you have to, um, the reward is, is down the line, you know. I, people always ask me, how, how can I keep playing the same piece, cello pieces by Bach? you know 30 40 years and literally it's because you can never you can never perfect it it's not something that can be perfected which i i find in artists and maybe you can speak to this um i find that's what draws artists to art is that the fact that it is this void that you'll never get it just right you'll get little glimpses of it but is that is it that way for you at all not only that way, but this goes back to where you began this interview, essentially, which is when did I think I was ready? And, and what you find out as an artist, and probably in many fields, is the more you do, the harder it gets, actually, because <laughs> you've still never played that Bach piece exactly the way it needs to be played. And no, I feel not when I sit down to write now, I used to be, you know, 30 years ago, going, oh, this is going to be great, because it's just going to pour out of me, and it's going to be beautiful and perfect. And now, of course, I realize, no, it may pour out of you, but it won't be beautiful and perfect. And you're going to have to rework it. And you're going to have to shape it. And, or if you're doing something <laughs> like a musical piece, it's like, well, that was mostly great, but there was a couple of bars there where I kind of lost the thread. And so, yeah, I think right. you're absolutely right. It's a constant uh, process of renewal and reexamination. And that's what's so intriguing about it, I, I think, for a lot of, lot of us, anyway. Hey Michael, I got. I, I thought maybe we could uh, go out on on a question for you from someone who's read all of your books. Oh wow! So I called. I wrote this friend whose whose name is Jean Nelson, and she's read everything you've written. And so I asked her if you could ask Michael Perry something, just out of the blue. <laughs> what would it be? So there's way too much to ask. So. Um, Here's, here's, wait, wait, wait for it. Oh, she wants to know what books are you reading now? And are you drawn to a particular genre? I'm, Any favorite author? Yeah, I, I like all sorts of different genres. I will, it just so happens I can reach to my right here. And all so, right, you're in the chair. You're I in the chair. Finished this big honking book about uh, Voltaire. And so that's obviously nonfiction. And it's a biography, and uh, Voltaire fascinates me because he was an artist and a renowned artist, but he was also smart about business, and he took care of his business so that he could have time to write. And then he um, wow was living in times. I, I'll just say that as I was reading that book and just reflecting on what's going on around us today, I was kind of like, well, this is kind of prescient, and um, some of it is more current than I would like, and. Like all history, <laughs> you hear notes, uh, yeah. And then let's see, what else have I got here? Um, oh, well, here, I'll grab, I, there are about six books over here, but I'll just grab this one. This is a book called Braided Creek, which is a book of poetry. And it was um, uh, Ted Kuzer and Jim Harrison, and they traded poems. They wrote them back and forth, and uh, kind of almost as correspondence. And Jim Harrison was a writer that changed my writing life for me. Um, not not a friend, not an wow. just his work, 
and early on, very early on. And then lastly, just kind yeah. of a totally different direction, is a book called Thick by a woman named Tressie McMillan Cottom. She's a, a PhD in sociology. And uh, this is a powerful book um, and very powerful right now. I, I referenced this book and I wrote a book called Montaigne and Barn Boots and I have a sec uh, chapter there called Roughneck Intersectionality. And uh, this, uh, <laughs> this helped me out with parts of that chapter. Ah, how very cool. Hey, Michael, I think uh, we'll leave it there because you and I could talk for hours, I know. Um, yeah. But thanks so much. It's been a pleasure to get some insight into you um, a little bit here. Just in a, up to this point, our insights have come usually backstage in a dressing room for five minutes while we're sitting around waiting for sound check but it's been nice talking to you man i enjoyed this thank you catch you down the road take care nice job ed <laughs> so here at the show we got a letter recently it was a letter from our very own tom mitchell and i'd like to share it with you now Many of our BCO fans want to know how it is possible to play so well. How, they ask, do Randy Sabine, Ed Willett, Jane Alexson, to name only three, well, she didn't name me, play so beautifully? It is the intelligent concentration, the endless hours of practice, the attention to detail, the knowledge, the experience. But it is more than that. The beauty arises from the touch. How a musician touches their instrument to bring out its best tones and sounds, the colors, the emotions, the art, if you will. Here, I offer a humble instructional video in two parts on that very subject. I believe our fans will like and appreciate it. I hope you will put it on the next Tiny Tent Show. Sincerely, Tom Mitchell. Well, this is clearly a unique and wonderful opportunity to peek behind the scenes and see what our musicians are doing when the spotlights are off and the microphones are unplugged. And, and so I am, I'm happy to say, I think this is a wonderful idea and a wonderful offer, Tom. And, and of course, we'll run the video. Here it is now. When playing the dog, it's important to remember to apply the proper touch. You don't want to press too hard. See what I mean? I hope we didn't go out of tune. <laughs> I'd like to say I didn't see that coming, but then again, uh, with Tom Mitchell, I'm really sure what's coming. Now, I can assure you, by the way, that no little dogs were harmed in the making of that video. But if Tom had tried to play that dog like an accordion and then played a polka on the dog, no less, uh, well, anyway, let's, let's just watch Severin Bainan and Jan Lee play a polka on twin accordion. <laughs>
Severin Bainan and Jan Lee with the music of my people, the polka. Um, so after our interview earlier, Ed Willett shared a story with me that I hadn't heard before. And he said that in May of 1976, which is the very same month and year that the Steve Miller Band released their big hit, Fly Like an Eagle, Ed decided to skip his upcoming senior year of high school in Manitowoc, Wisconsin, Manthe, as those from there call it. He decided to skip his senior year and leave his hometown behind and head off to college. So he says he remembers flying down the highway in his 65 Rambler American. And on the radio, Steve Miller's Fly Like an Eagle was playing. And Ed says he remembers listening to that tune and thinking, yeah, man, that is what I'm doing. I'm flying like an eagle. And then he says he went, well, actually, I'm just driving to UW Oshkosh. So it's a great, it's a great moment either way, I think. And uh, here's Ed now with some help from Jane Allison to relive that moment of flying like an eagle.
to the sea. Fly like an eagle, let my spirit carry me. I want to fly like an eagle till I'm free. Oh, oh, there's a solution. Well, good morning, everyone. Well, here are the words attributed to Chief Seattle that I've recited at the Chautauqua stage. It's called, All Things Are Connected. Every part of this earth is sacred. Every shining pine needle, every sandy shore, every mist in the dark woods, every clearing and humming insect is holy. This we know, the earth does not belong to people. People belong to the earth. You must teach your children that the ground beneath their feet is the ashes of our grandparents. The shining water that moves in the streams and rivers is not just water, but the blood of our ancestors. So that they will respect the land, tell your children that the earth is rich with the lives of our kin. Teach your children that the earth is our mother. This we know, all things are connected like the blood that unites one family. All things are connected. Peace, stay well, be kind, show love and mercy, empathy, and here's to better days to come. Bless you. Amen, and thank you, Jack. Well, to send us on our way at full tempo for this week, we go back to 2008, when a special tent was constructed at the Minnesota State Fair so that the Blue Canvas Orchestra could perform Old Minnesota, Song of the North Star, which was a special show put together by Warren Nelson to honor the state in question. And they put that tent up so that the BCO could play a two-week run of four shows a day. Folks, that is some heavy hauling. But you would never know it from this footage and the energy that you see from each performer. So here they are now in a BCO flashback, the Blue Canvas Orchestra performing Hands on the Land. Keep your hands on the land, lay your hands on the land. Prayer from the prairie all the year go round, heaven on this farm comes up from the ground. Keep your hands, lay your hands on the land. I said keep your hands keep your on hands. sun to come out or if there is a
year after we staked our claim. Glory in the sod house when the first job came. Then another, another, another upgrade. There's a crew that's good with all the work it do. Long before the rooster crows, long before the dawn. First light seen that farm kitchen kerosene. But a mature cow pigs, chickens to feed. Oh, historical prayer, a prayer prayed in the Red River Valley days of King Wheat, a prayer from 1886, over the harvest that was bound for the Minneapolis Mills, a prayer I found in a book. It was a good book. It wasn't the good book, but it was a good book. Diaries of Mary Dodge Woodward, a prayer printed in the Fargo Argus and therein given eternal printed life. The deacon speaks. O Lord, we thank thee that our crops have not yielded us loss. But we would earnestly pray for better prices for wheat. And we pray thee, O Lord, that thou wouldst protect us against false inspection of wheat. And we beseech thee, O Lord, to see that Brother Smith's men do not misinform us. We know the value of wheat, but we need your guidance, Lord, to tell us how much we should receive when we deliver. Only thou knowest what goes on in that elevator. Amen. But we do not. So we pray thee, Lord, inform us, and thy name shall have the glory forever and ever. Amen. Oh, amen. amen. Well, aren't you glad all the time they took pictures of this place over the fence long ago? Memory stares a face, the family on the farm, the tea man, the plow raising house, beef and barn. They're all gone now over the prairie, through the big woods, a Minnesota view of all that once was up and all that was new in the old faded photographs the ancestors stand with their boots on the mortgage and their hands on the land keep your hands on the land lay your hands on the land prayer from the prairie all the year go around heaven on this farm Well, folks, that's our Tiny Tent Show for tonight. We sure do thank you for tuning in to watch and listen in these times more than ever, really. 
Um, we also want to make sure and thank our sponsors. Jim and Joy Perry, Kim Ogle and Ruth Getz, Hanson's IGA, Star North up there in Cornucopia, BMO Harris Bank, Brownstone Pharmacy in Washburn, Jim and Joanne Collins, Quilts on the Wall Design with Barb and Bill Gover, Ashland Daily Press, Big Top Friends, the Bujolds, the Manleys, the Sandstroms and Roths, and Myra Ainers. And now the time has come not to bid adieu or say goodbye, but rather, as we say around here, uh, well, I suppose, forward.